the Honorable N. Savala Naik and distinguished members of the High Commission of India, members of the Indian Cultural Society, <coughs> Dr. Bani Kohli, who is on his way, I understand, other distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm deeply moved to share these thoughts on the great Mahatma Mohandas Gandhi with you on this the commemoration of his 150th birthday. I express my heartfelt gratitude to High Commissioner, His Excellency Sabala Naik and Mrs. Naik for this honor. My Jamaican Indian father, Sidney Gopal Singh, a Hindu, died when I was four years old, and our mother, encouraged us to leap through a scrapbook that he had kept. There, in pride of place, was a newspaper clipping of the great Mahatma Gandhi with a report on his extended fast in his nationwide leadership of a resistance against British colonialism. My surname was changed to Lowry when my widowed mother later married Jocelyn Lowry. And so, at that impressionable age, the influence of this man of courage took root, challenging us to a brave and altruistic way of life. I am pleased that my sister Frances is with us today, a dedicated volunteer who lives this path of courage and giving. With her is her husband, William Baird, an African-American who recalls the day his parents marched in Washington, D.C. with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who had declared that Gandhi inspired his campaign of peaceful resistance for civil rights. My husband, Rupert, is proud that he shares the same birth month as the Mahatma and I believe my family will agree that he is indeed a man of peace and justice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to see Dr. Michael Cogan. And of course, the symbol of a liberal is a scale of justice. How appropriate. I shared the request from His Excellency Knight with family members and friends of Indian ancestry, so they could give me their reflections on the great soul of the land. Here are their reflections. From my cousin, Rachel Mayer Boxer. Perhaps his most significant word for me is his respect for all religions, in particular Christianity. The quote that has stayed with Rachel is, for me, Different religions are beautiful flowers from the same garden or branches of the same majestic tree. And Rachel says that in a time when the media, in particular social media, seems to foster unnecessary criticism of various belief systems, this genuine respect for all is refreshing and empowering. So she continues, I am especially captivated with the impact that the Beatitudes preached by Jesus Christ had on him and his promotion of non-violence. In a religion, in a region struggling to maintain peace, these words that had such a powerful impact on him should also be our mantra. Of significance too is the simplicity of his lifestyle which we should definitely imitate. Then, our cousin, Dawn Williams Bobo, whose son, Brandon, has been grieving the loss of his schoolmates in the shooting at the Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. So Dawn wrote, in this age, when there is so much hurt and anger being unleashed, not only on the political and global front, but also in our daily interactions with 
our fellow citizens are constantly reminded of his quote, the weak have never forgiven. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. Andrea Jagar Williams wrote, I think the following quote is so true. It is health that is real wealth, not pieces of gold and silver. She notes that our mental, physical, spiritual, and social well-being determines our happiness and harmony with the universe. My cousin, Winnie Moon Policy Mayor, says, what I remember is that my father had a photograph of Gandhi hanging in the shop at Savannah Mar. Later, I learned he was an activist in India promoting peace and nonviolence. I was inspired by his books. My sister Sandra simply said the feeling, I love and revere this great soul. My friend Valerie Durant Brown wrote, my favorite Gandhi quote is, be the change you want to see. And then, and then, I received this stunning email from my brother, Sidney Tony Mopolson Laurie. In your hand. He wrote, this is a very significant moment for Jamaicans of Indian descent. And he said to me, see if you can find Marcus Garvey's address to the UNIA on the day of Mahatma Gandhi's arrest by the British colonial government. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, here I was, priding myself on knowing so much about Jamaica's first national hero, Marcus Mosiah Gandhi. And I did not know this, but respect to me. I was able to retrieve the speech from the Duke University collection prepared by Jamaica's old professor, Robert Hill, and I'm honored to share excerpts of this brilliant address made by Marcus Garvey to the UNIA in New York on March 12, 1922. He begins his wide-ranging speech with this. And these are all the words of Marcus Garvey on Gandhi. News has come to us that India's great leader, Mahatma Gandhi, has been arrested for advocating the cause of 380 million Indians, the cause of freedom of his country. He has been arrested by an alien government that seeks to disrupt, to destroy the freedom of 380 million of people. You are well acquainted with the work of Gandhi. For 25 years, Gandhi has been agitating the cause of his countrymen. Within the last three years, he became very active. He organized a movement that had swept the entire country of India, a movement that has united the different castes of India that have been apart for centuries. The British people are now feeling the pressure of Gandhi's propaganda, and remember propaganda is used here in a positive way. It is customary, says Garvey, for them to suppress the cause of liberty. It is customary for them to execute and imprison the leaders of the cause of liberty everywhere. Therefore, he says, Gandhi's arrest is nothing unexpected to those of us who understand what leadership means. Leadership means sacrifice. Leadership means martyrdom. Hundreds of thousands of men as leaders have died in the past for the freedom of their country, the emancipation of their respective peoples. And we will expect nothing else from Gandhi but that self-sacrifice and martyrdom that will ultimately free this country and his countrymen. Our learned Marcus Gandhi compares Gandhi to the Irish freedom fighter, Terence McSweeney. Gandhi, as you know, says Gandhi is 
is one of the noblest characters of the day. Like Max Feeney, I believe he will pave the way ultimately for India's freedom. Max Feeney's death a couple of years ago paved the way for an Irish free state. And I believe that the sacrifice, the imprisonment of Mahatma Gandhi will, will ultimately pave the way for a free and independent India. And he says he pledges the support of all Negroes of the world who support the principles of this organization. Now here, what happened that I did not know? He says that within the last 12 hours, he got a bit of news that came from the island of Jamaica, where, as is the custom of the people I mentioned, that is the British, they called upon the West Indian regiments to go out to India. The black soldiers who have always fought for them in their wars of conquest, world wars one and two, to fight the Indians. And guess what? They refused to go. The West Indian regiment refused to go. He said, this is the effect of the propaganda of UNIA and the Bill of Rights of the First Convention of 1920 when Garvey and his organization declared that no Negro, in quotes now, shall take up arms against other men and especially against men of his race and those with whom he is in sympathy without first knowing what he is about to fight for. The Negroes of the world have no cause against India. The Negroes of the world, on the contrary, are in sympathy with India and there are 400 million Negroes who are prepared to stand behind 380 million Indians to see that they get their freedom. So Garvey reads from a cable that he had sent to the Premier of England and to the King of England. So he sent this cable and he said, 400 million Negroes are in sympathy with Mahatma Gandhi, whom you have arrested. We are for the freedom of India and the complete liberation of the African colonies. We wish your nation all that is good, but not at the expense of the liberties of the dark peoples of the earth. And he says, he mentions that Rome, Greece, Spain, Germany fell because of imperialistic designs and aggression. And he says, may you, that's the king, that's King George he's talking to, may you profit by their experience by acting now to avert the bloody conflict that threatens all humanity. Let us have peace by being just is the prayer of 400 million. Now, Mahat Marcus Garvey will declare that the arrest of Mahatma Gandhi was not a setback because there were murmurs that, oh, well, he's locked up now. This is a big setback. And this is what he said. There are many people who believe that the cause of the Indians is lost because of the arrest of Mahatma Gandhi. They do not understand the psychology of great movements. They do not well appreciate the valuable records of history, records that attest the struggles, the sacrifices made by leaders for the rights and liberties of their people. Those of you who are students of history know that all reform movements, I mean reform movements that are worthwhile, have had to pay as far as the leaders are concerned. They have had to pay the price of the liberty of the people in whose interest and for whose freedom they were begun. In this National Heritage Week here in Jamaica, we Jamaicans of Indian ancestry stand proud with our first national hero, Marcus Messiah Garvey, in our memory of the triumph of Mahatma Gandhi 
in this historic campaign. Thank you, Your Excellency, for this opportunity to share the pride and joy of we Jamaicans of Indian ancestry as we celebrate the 150th birthday of this extraordinary leader. We give thanks that God bless the world with this enduring example of the strength of peace and love. Thank you and may God bless you. Love 
tolerance, compassion, and sympathy. I would suggest that these are the concepts that are engendered in Gandhi's practice of Ahimsa and that they represent authentic ways of perceiving ourselves and other people in the entire world. What could be observed from this concept is that they do not belong to the category and realm of the physical, meaning a world that is defined by science in terms of space and time. Rather, in the words of Ludwig Wittgenstein, I apologize you know, for you see, I cannot just uh, but quote Wittgenstein because he was a philosopher that actually portrayed the idea which I want to put across. They relate to what he called physiognomy rather than physiology. Physiognomy is a form of expressive of character. Physiognomy depends on the use of creative and critical human imagination. Physiognomy operates at two levels, the level of the subjective and the level of intersubjective. Now, I want to explain that kind of jargon. It means that as a human person, we are endowed by imagination. In other words, we are not limited to what we can see physically here and now. We are also endowed with the ability to think and create ideas and imagine you know, ideas which are not presently within our uh, reach. And this is the kind of ways by which we can generate knowledge that is new which can actually lead to new ideas. That is what Wittgenstein regarded as a uh, physiognomy. At the subjective level, and I want to quote, it's a kind of quotation that needs to be put in context. Wittgenstein said, look into someone else's face and see the consciousness in it and also a particular shape of consciousness. You see on it, indeed, joy, indifference, interest, excitement, dullness, among others, delight in it in the face of another. What we get is saying is that as a human person, even though we are subjectively made, we have the potentiality of projecting ourselves into looking at the other person and trying to see what is happening to this person in terms of uh, his or her condition. When we see a face that is smiling, there is a tendency for us to say, oh, that person is in good mood. When we see a face that is wrinkling, oh, so something is wrong. So these are the kind of things where we can relate, even though we cannot get to know what is happening in that person's mind. But from what is happening in his face, we can create and imagine what is actually happening to that person. That is also one aspect of his Now, the perception of the other Display body parts, beheading of person, sexually abusing a three-year-old child, random shootings of school children and their teachers, and using chemical weapons to begin civilians are indeed wrong. How do we know that they are wrong? Apart from the fact that we are physically seeing these uh, terrible events. However, the message of non-violence preached by Gandhi does recognize the notion of structural violence. That is, the kind of violence that is not overt, such as murder, assassination, and other forms of physical attacks and killings. 
Structural violence is the most basic form of violence. It is expensive of the conditions of society, the structure of social order, and the institutional arrangements of power that reproduce mass violations of personhood, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The point that I'm making here is that even though when Gandhi was preaching the notion of non-violence, he did recognize the fact that violence can be done by the type of arrangement that is set up within a particular social order, especially the capitalist colonial arrangement that is set to actually destroy all the cultural ideas of the people and replace them by their own kind of idea. For Gandhi, that is a form of violence. Inequality of all types. For him, it's also a form of violence. Unequal distribution of wealth. Unequal distribution of power. Unequal distribution of resources. In such a way that few people actually grasp much what is supposed to be shared by some other people and try to use them for their own purposes. For Gandhi, that is a form of structural violence. So it is not the case that Gandhi did not recognize violence at all. What he preached was we should not try to compensate that kind of violence with another violence because violence begets violence. However, despite the evil effects of structural violence, Gandhi advocated for a non-violent response to it, according to him. An eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. Putting this slogan into practice requires a different kind of behavior from what actually obtains in our world at present, where people respond to violence by other forms of violence, which are in some instances out of proportion. Gandhi's occurrence of violent response to violence is justified by polar fraternities of dehumanization and humanization, which is both the pedagogy of the oppressed. For him, the oppressor. Here, the oppressor initiates violence, and the oppressed, who is a victim of violence, who wants to respond to violence, are both victims of oppression. <laughs> both of them are victims of violence, they are victims of oppression. And so, the oppressor lives in constant fear that a time might come when they are not aware that the oppressed will strike in order to throw up the yoke of oppression. On the other hand, the oppressed is always at risk of internalizing oppression, thereby leading to a psychologically warped situation, which may be difficult to be extricated. The solution to oppression, then, is for persons to strive at eliminating the conditions and circumstances that generate oppressive situations. Let us for a few, min few minutes, I am talking to the audience, Your Excellency, try to particularize the notion of physiognomy as defined by Wittgenstein and related to Gandhi's message. Step one, I am a person. I love myself, no doubt, self-love, which is a law of all ethical theories. In other words, Every person loves himself or herself. Loving oneself and just acting in order to avoid mystery. When we love ourselves, what we do is to do things to ourselves that can avoid mystery. For example, if we are sick, it is part of self-love to seek medical attention. Step two, through the power of creative imagination, we are able to transcend self-love to loving other people. Using the notion of his own loving, we are able to look at the face of a person who is in need, have a perception of his or her condition, 
This will generate feeling of love, compassion, and sympathy. This creates in us an obligation to act in order to mitigate the condition of the person. So it is not enough for us to be able to have a creative imagination to know what is happening to the person. That if we have that deep imagination, we now have the obligation to help or assist that person in whatever way in which we can. That is the ethical aspect which uh, Gandhi is also preaching. We want to ask ourselves, what comes to our minds when we see on television immigrants from Syria, Africa, Bangladesh, on plastic boats trying to cross the sea to seek asylum or greener pastures in Europe? How do we relate to displaced persons in Indonesia who are victims of the tsunami? Persons from North and South Carolina displaced by Hurricane Florence and lately persons from Florida who are victims of Hurricane Michael. Is it enough for us to just watch them on television? Okay, what is expected for us to generate a creative and critical imagination and put ourselves in their position and then ask ourselves, what can we do to ameliorate their condition? And I want to relate my own personal experience of the notion of physical pain. Um, do I have, what time do I have, sir? Maybe a couple of minutes. A couple of minutes? Thank you very much. Few years back, I was at the collectorate office at Crossroads to renew my vehicle license. I queued up on the senior citizen line, the senior citizen. I noticed that a lady walked in and she appeared to be dancing. My first impression was that something was wrong with her because such an office is not an arena for entertainment. But even when she appeared to be dancing, I did not see joy in her face. There were other people who were watching this strange behavior, especially on the regular line where the young lady killed up. Nobody bothered about the strange behavior. At the point in time, a lady was bold enough to approach our young lady and ask her, Are you okay? She promptly responded that no. This was because she was in an excruciating pain. Despite this, nobody was willing to do anything about her condition. But people had the opportunity to transact her business and give to see medical attention. I overheard the discussion and I decided to ask the next person on the interview that I would like to allow the lady to transact her business before me. The person agreed and the young lady was able to transfer her business and left to seek medical attention. Many of us might want to ask, given the fact that human beings can pretend, human beings can deceive, okay? You want to ask whether that lady actually acted in that way to be allowed to transfer her business by jumping the line. My response to this is that when we are in a situation like this, we need to activate our power of creative imagination to design the reality of a human situation and respond appropriately. The reason why we do not often do this is that we human beings are always in a rush and in a hurry, and we hardly devote time for self-reflection and therefore becoming a mechanical being. Putting into practice our critical and creative imagination offers an alternative to our mechanistic ways of conducting our affairs at both personal and interpersonal levels of life. What I want you to take away from this aspect of Gandhi's philosophy is to consider alternative ways of perceiving ourselves, other persons, and the world at large. We should not see ourselves and others as mere physical objects to be used to achieve special uh, purposes. Human beings are affective beings and we must relate to ourselves as such. We need to seriously consider the principle of non-violence as advocated by Gandhi, the father of nations, 
It involves the cultivation and practice of positive emotions of love, tolerance, compassion, and sympathy. If we can do this and speak to others about it, then our world can start to witness a revolution that is devoid of violence. If this is achievable, then Mahatma Gandhi would not have suffered and died in vain. Finally, another aspect of Gandhi's philosophy that I would like to share with the audience relates to his idea of peace education. This is where Gandhi's philosophy interfaces with that of Marcus Gavin and Bomani. I am very happy that I have you know, my co-speaker talking about the relationship between Gandhi and Marcus Gavin. The three icons, I mean Marcus Gavin, Bomani, and Gandhi, saw colonial education as a form of oppression and exploitation where the educator uses his or her position to exploit and oppress the non-educated. It must be noted that Marcus Garvey used Rastafari movement to spread the messages against educational and economic oppression. Likewise, Bobali in his lyrics, One Drop, spoke about the abandonment of evil philosophy, which is a kind of education that we will see that people want to oppress one another. In this presentation, I am concluding now, my dear Excellency. What has been brought to the fore is the need for us not to learn only, not to learn only by heart, the philosophy of Mahatma Gandhi that has become a household uh, name. Rather, we need by habit to cultivate in practical terms the application of Gandhi's philosophy to our lives, whether as personal and international levels. This will involve the kind of creative and critical imagination spoken about in this presentation. This may not be too easy to do, but if we have the willpower, nothing is impossible in order to restore our world to a level in which all persons will enjoy the richness of the purpose of human creation. Thank you.